the letter um, to the Christians in Galatia, uh, Galatia, if you're not aware, is a place in uh, modern-day Turkey. All right, and so when you, when you read the book of Galatians, you're reading a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians that were in this, this particular space, all right? And uh, typically, you didn't have, like Lapeer County, as last stat I saw, has about 130 churches, um, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, right? There's 80,000 people, uh, or yeah, 80,000 people, I think, in Lapeer County is what the stat said, 130 churches for all those 80,000 people. Um, that's a lot of churches, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. So we have a lot of different churches. Um, and it's not like Paul is writing to the rising Christian church. He's, he's, he's not doing that. He's writing to, when you read the book of Galatians, he's writing to the Christians in Galatia. So it would be as if Paul was writing to the Christians in Lapeer County, right? Does that make sense to you? So when he's writing this letter, uh, it's this place in modern day Turkey. The Apostle Paul is writing some, some really strong feelings, um, and I kind of like this book because Paul gets a little punchy in it, and it's fun to read it that way. But um, he's writing because they're turning their backs on the freedom Christ has offered to us through the cross. And here's how here, he's, he's greeted them in his letter, and here's some of the first things that he says when he's writing this letter. It's Galatians 1, 6 through 10. It says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, a curse be on him. Now, I want to pause right there just for a second because that's how he opens the letter, right? He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace. He's calling them out right off the bat, right? You can kind of tell that like Paul's feeling a little bit like, oh, we got we to gotta fight. This is, we got something we got to talk about and this, is, this has got to handle. But here's where I really want, to, I want us to pay attention to is verse 10. It says, for I am now trying to persuade... For, I'm sorry, for am I now trying to persuade people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want to zero in on verse 10. I, I just like Galatians, and that was for free. That wasn't even part of my sermon, really. Um, I just want you to get interested in reading Galatians because it's a good book. But this is huge. This is very, very, very powerful for some of us in our lives. And as we're talking about our significance, our self-worth, um, he says, am I striving to please people? How many of you are people pleasers? We got a few that are just like, yeah, there, yep, yep. A couple that should have all, all four limbs in the air, right? Um, people pleasers. You, the, 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 the mark of a people pleaser is that you can't say what word? Yes, exactly. All right. You can't tell someone no. Why? You want to make them happy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, I think it's fantastic. We got lots of people pleasers in the air. I am a recovering people pleaser. Um, <laughs> we're, going, we're going to start a support group for that. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, we should, honestly. Uh, but it's, it's <laughs> I can't believe that got an amen. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. No, I'm so glad. Because uh, it actually makes, it makes a lot of sense, honestly. Um, uh, <laughs> there's so many things I want to say right now, but I can't. Because uh, you guys want to eat lunch at a normal time. So um, here's what he says. This is important. This is super, 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 super important. Uh Am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Ouch. Right? So those of you that had your hands up in the air, we got some things to talk about. And probably some other people, because I think this applies to more than just the people pleasers in the room. But it's important that we understand in the right mindset here. Because... um, I want to start here today, and we're going to go into Colossians, but uh, these words do not give us, I want to make it clear, these words do not give us permission to go around just ticking people off whenever we want to, 
okay? This doesn't say that, that I don't have to please people, or I don't have to love people, or I don't have to do certain things. What he's saying is, is it's not my primary motivation to please people, all right? Uh, I can say no to certain situations. I can uh, disappoint people in life. It is not our primary mission as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, to make people happy. Everybody say, whew. Because you know what happens is when you disappoint somebody, a lot of times this gets thrown in our faces if, if we're trying to follow Jesus and we're being sort of adamant and outgoing about it, is that once we disappoint someone, what are the words that usually come out of that person's mouth? Oh, you're such a good Christian, aren't you? Yeah, I am, because Jesus told me not to please people, and I'm not pleasing you right now, so boom, right? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> no, I'm kidding. Um, but that's, that's how you're not supposed to use it, by the way. Uh, but, but yeah, no, the, the, we have permission to be our own person. Um, we have permission to be who God created us to be. So the church is facing a battle because the church at large hasn't been super compassionate to the people around us. All right. Um, there's, there's. I've talked to a number of people, and, and being in this position, it's kind of interesting to watch uh, when when you reveal that you're a pastor. Watching people just completely change, like we're chameleons. It's amazing. Um, but uh, I'm losing my train of thought. Hang on. <laughs> Too much coffee today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so the church is facing this battle. And, and because we haven't been, we haven't been, we just haven't been compassionate to people around us. And, and I've heard often it said that um, Christians are more often wounded by people in the church than outside of the church. And, and that's something that's got to change. Uh, it's something that's definitely got to change. Um, part of that is, is, is because of some certain expectations that we have of one another because we live by this. But um, God also gives us way to, to reconcile with one another and to um, restore those that have fallen into sin or have, have you know, fallen into addiction or whatever it is that they deal with. But um, just because we're not pleasing people doesn't mean that we're a real jerk, all right? We don't just go around saying, you know, you're, you're sinful or you're evil or whatever. You, you don't just do that. It just means, what this means, what Paul's trying to communicate is that we're just not afraid. We're just not afraid. The Bible talks about fearing not all the time. And in the last few weeks, we've, we've been looking at our significance. Where do we draw our self-worth from? Where is it, where is it that we, we, what well, let's put it that way, what well do we go to to draw from in order to make ourselves feel significant? What is it that, that, that brings us a sense of worth? And there was a week, the first week that we were talking about this, I think it was Gary that, that mentioned the word, and I thought this was huge um, because it's exactly where I was headed, is that a lot of times we're afraid to approach the throne of God because we feel unworthy. We feel unworthy. We don't feel like we're valuable to God. We feel like that if we were to walk into the presence of God, it would be bad. I was talking with somebody this week who, who works with the underprivileged, and, and she said that so many people, when you mention them going to church, they, they say that when they, they, they believe, or figuratively believe, that if they were to walk into a church to get help, to, to find the Lord, find God, find some sort of assistance in life as far as a spiritual and, and valuable feeling kind of worth, they believe that the church would catch on fire or blow up or implode or people would just reject them and throw them out. And so they resist coming to the church. They resist getting involved in a group of Christians because of this issue. And it's huge. So we've been talking about this significance. Where do we draw this self-worth from? What makes us important? Why do we feel valued or not valued? And as a result, what I'm hoping to accomplish today is the same mindset that, that Paul has here as he confronts the Christians in Galatia, that we not try to please people out of fear. So we've already established that people pleasers try to please people because they think that they're helping or they think that they're being nice or they're afraid of disappointing people, right? 
one of the main motivations is fear. We don't want people not to like us. Like I'm, I told you, I'm a recovering person. So a lot of times, um, a lot of times people would ask me to do something and I'd be like, my inside would scream, no, right? And I'd be like, yeah, no problem. I'll do that for you. I'd love to help you. <laughs> First of all, Are you laughing because at me, or are you laughing because you've done it? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad, because I'm sitting here going, I just want to make sure I'm not nuts up here talking to you guys this morning. But it happens, right? And so what happens is not only now, now you're angry with yourself, because you've gotten yourself into something, uh, or, or if, you're, if you're in denial that you're a people pleaser, you're mad at them because they asked you to do something, and you were totally in control of it, but because they asked you and you can't say no, it's their fault, right? So you're mad at them. On the other, uh, but uh, something else that you need to realize is you just told a bold-faced lie. You just lied. And what? And you rationalized it. Yeah, absolutely, because I'm being nice to that person, so it's okay for me to lie to them and say, yeah, I'd love to help you out. Nope. You sinner. Jeez, right? <laughs> that's what you got to look at it as. Is that's, that's, that's what you have, to, you have to understand, is that this people-pleasing thing is a, is a, is a stinking trap. Um, it's horrible. So being this recovered people pleaser, I know the lies I told myself uh, because I'd say yes to someone who asked me to do something that I really didn't want to do and, and then, I, then, then complain before going to do whatever it was that they wanted me to do. I would complain in my mind during what I was doing because I didn't want to do it and then I would complain after and I'd be like, oh, this is, I just can't believe I just, you know, whatever. And, and, I, and then, by the way, that's also sinful because Philippians 2.14 says do everything without complaining or grumbling. Uh, and, and so, boom, you're violating like three commandments or three, three things that God doesn't want us to be um, just because you're a people pleaser. So can you tell I'm really trying to help you get out of that and establish some boundaries today? Um, just making you feel terrible, people pleasers in the room. Um, but usually what was happening is I didn't enjoy what I was doing. Um, I harbored a bit of anger and resentment toward that person that had asked me to do it. But when you trace it back, I could have said no and avoided the whole thing but it probably would have led to some disappointment, or at least that's what I believe. And here's the bottom line, and, and, and I had to do some soul searching to find this out, and, and I would encourage you to do the same, but why didn't I say no? I didn't want to give the person a reason uh, to not like me. That seems noble, to the people pleaser especially, to, to, to those of you that are like, you don't really care about the other person's emotions, like that makes no sense to you at all. I understand that. But for probably at least half of us in the room, that makes total sense. It is a noble thing to self-sacrifice and to help people where, where they need help, even though we don't really want to do that. And there are times that we have to do that. Um, I did, I, 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 never mind, I'm not going to go there. Um, the question is though is, what does that say about me? What does that say about you? If you're in the same boat, what does that say about you? You're not genuine. Yeah, absolutely. I learned that I was insecure. I learned that I was insecure. I learned that I actually had a low view of myself. That all I had to offer was being a doormat and allowing other people to use me in whatever way they saw fit. I had no boundaries. I couldn't be honest with people, if, and if people found out how I really felt, then they felt disappointed be, that I couldn't just be honest with them and somewhat guilty because they felt somewhat responsible for me doing something that I really didn't want to do in the first place. And, and this is, this is what I'm describing right now is the fear of rejection in its finest form. It is the fear of rejection that holds many of us very, very, very captive. Remember a few weeks ago, we started talking about this, this lie that we like to believe, that our self-worth is performance plus others' opinions. That's how we come to the conclusion of how much you and I are worth. And so we look at what we can do, and we talked about that last week, and then we look at what others' opinions are of us, and we combine those two things in order to, com to, to form what we think we're worth in this world, and we usually compare to other people. 
Now, the way that we see ourselves is comprised of basically two main parts. So when we look at others' opinions um, and we look at performance, we see, we see two things. So this is another way of saying this equation. The way we see ourselves is two parts. How we view ourselves, and typically that brings in the performance aspect, but then how we think others perceive us. That word think is very important in there because do you really know how others perceive you? No. I, I mean, unless you know you've got an honest friend that will just tell you everything, you know. But even then, it's sometimes hard to trust them, isn't it? How many times, okay, let's just, let me bring this into the real world. How many times have you complimented somebody else and you really didn't think it looked nice? Oh, I like what you have on today. Oh, I like your hair today. Right? <laughs> oh, you did a great job. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and redo that an hour later. You know what I mean? <laughs> kind of a thing. How many times have we, been on, have we been dishonest with people? And I mean, it happens. And that's why we were taught if you can't say anything, well, that's, actually, that's kind of a symptom. of the, If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. So we're in that awkward silence, and we're like, I got to say something. I'll lie, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that makes total sense. So we have this equation. This is a lie. This is a lie. These things do not equal your self-worth. And so how we view ourselves is important. How we think others perceive us, this is not something that we can get around. All right, there is, there is very, very good uh, psychology that we can look at, that we understand. And one of the things that I've definitely learned in the last year of my life is that you have to understand and accept how you feel. There are days when we can't control what we feel, how we feel, and we've got to figure out where the source of that is coming from. Okay? Like, I'm a guy that likes to be in control of my own body. That's why I don't like roller coasters, Right? I don't like to not be in control of my body. I am not putting myself in, in, into somebody else's hand, some machine's hands, right, that can just throw me off whenever it wants to, right? Um, but I've learned in the last year that I can have emotions that I can't control. And sometimes you just got to take a day and let it be. But you've got to do some soul searching and figure out what's going on underneath. Why am I angry? Why am I sad? Why am I happy? Why am I having a good day when yesterday I had a bad day? Nothing's changed, right? Kind of a thing. And so there are some times that we've just got to deal with this. Now, how we think versus how we think others perceive us. That's a great combination to figure out our self-worth when it's balanced. But if... if um, I don't know about you, but I've realized that I tend to think the worst about what other people think of me. Are you in that same boat too, or am I just diseased? Um, no, I, you tend to think the worst. Like somebody goes cross-eyed at you, and you're like, they don't like me, right? And, and, and really, they just have an eye problem or something. And, but we take the littlest things, and we turn, them into, we turn them into conclusions of what that other person may be thinking instead of just asking them what, the, what they might be thinking. So compliments, a lot of times, are smoke and mirrors. Um, I, I'll, su I'll supplant what you've said and uh, what you said you think and exchange it with what, you, what I think you're thinking. Did you catch that? No, I know. It was meant to be a little confusing because it's really a dumb concept, but, but this is what happens, and I've, I've, I've paid attention to this in my own mind. Compliments are just smoke and mirrors, so they mean nothing, right? How many of you are really bad at taking a good compliment? A lot of people are. Okay, yeah, that's it. Uh, me too. But what will happen is I will take what you've said and that compliment or what you've told me that you think, and I will replace that with what I think you're thinking. Does that make sense? Okay, better. Clear as mud, right? I get, I get it. But that's messed up. If, you, if I trust you to tell me the truth and what comes out of your mouth is not what I think you're thinking and I just go, yeah, compliments backed out of the air and you, you think I'm a jerk, so I'm just not going to talk to you anymore, right? 
It's really bad. It's really bad how this works. So if this is our baseline, if others' opinions are, um, are weighty in how we value ourselves, or at least what we think others' opinions are, they're real or maybe concocted in our minds, then what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up to feed a fear of rejection. This fear is rampant in our society today. Uh, loneliness is one of the most dangerous and widespread problems in America today. That's why the suicide rates are going up, is that people don't feel like they have anyone around them. They don't feel like they have any support system. They don't feel like they have anything going for them. And they turn to alcohol, they turn to drugs, they turn to groups that, that they can do. And what this is, is, is it partly is a problem with the fear of rejection that people have said you're not valuable for whatever reason, or at least we feel that for some reason. And it's not just a secular thing either. It's not just a secular thing. There was a survey done at a Bible conference that revealed that 92% of Christian attendees admitted to loneliness being a major problem in their lives. 92% of this conference attendees. Now, I don't know how big that conference was, so I don't know how much of a supply or a, a sample size that that was, but the basic feeling of rejection is a sense of despair at feeling unloved and a fear of being unwanted or unaccepted. And you might be sitting here thinking, you know, I don't care what people think of me, Right? Because that's what we like to say, isn't it? I don't really care what they think of me, you know. Yeah, you do. You might not care what some stranger at the store thinks of you. But someone sitting next to you, maybe, right? Like you fear maybe being rejected by them. Wouldn't you? You'd fear being rejected by people in this room, your spouse, friendships, your boss, your coworkers. Wouldn't you? <laughs> that is, we're going to let him out of the box. That's okay. Um, but why do you clean up your language when you walk into this building? Why do you act a certain way at work and then you act another way at a restaurant and then another way in private and then <clears throat> another way when you're here sitting in these chairs in church? Did I get you? <laughs> in some form, in some form, that's a fear of rejection. I'm not saying that you should come in here and use the language that you use at work. You know what I mean? I bleep and love you, God. You know, I mean, that's just not probably the way we should roll here. Um, so I do appreciate that. Well, we can have that conversation later because um, now you got me thinking on something else. But yeah, I think, uh, exactly, exactly. See, the thing is, is that that's, that's kind of an integrity thing, obviously. But rejection is a good thing when used appropriately. It is a form of communication. It is a form of, of uh, social um, normalizing, I guess you could say. Uh, but when it is used appropriately, in some ways it's a form of accountability, isn't it? I'm not going to accept that behavior from you anymore. How many times have parents had to use that? What's the, what's the, what's the word that parents use most often? No. No, don't do that. No, stop that. No, don't run over there. No, stop running. No, go to sleep, right? No, wake up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that works, but right. No, 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 no. What is that? That is rejection. Your behavior is unacceptable right now. You need to stop that, but what is it? It's not that the child is unacceptable. It's what? His behavior is unacceptable. You're not saying the child has no worth, but you are saying that is not something that's okay to do. It's a good thing. It's a perfect thing for rearing a child, is it not? Because if we were never told no, what happens? Well, uh, you, know, you guys can all come to that conclusion. I'm not going to draw that conclusion. Um, so no is a form of rejection, and it's A-OK -okay in a lot of situations, but when you believe at your core that you are unlovable, that you are unwanted, or that you are unacceptable, it is going to drive your behavior. 
the Proverbs will tell us that, that, um, that, that all, of, all, of our, all of our actions flow out of our heart. And so what we believe at our core level, what we feel at our core level is going to drive our behavior. And so with a fear of rejection, here's some of the things that are going to happen that you're going to see. Now, here's, here, I want you to look at this as twofold. One, look at it for you. Use this as a self-examination kind of a thing. If you see some of these behaviors in your life, you need to think, maybe I've got some sort of a fear of rejection going on. But the other thing is, is that as people that want to help other people, that want to bring hope of Jesus Christ to other people, you may see some of these behaviors in other people and you may be able to understand and therefore actually help someone if you can recognize that they're dealing with a fear of rejection, a people-pleasing problem, right? Okay, so here's some of the behaviors. If the fear of rejection, you'll do this. You'll give in to peer pressure in order to gain approval. You'll be easily manipulated. Um, you'll join certain clubs or organizations to find acceptance. You'll identify with social groups thinking that being with others like yourself will assure your acceptance and approval. You'll definitely be, be angry and, uh, and, and full of resentment. Um, you'll become codependent. And what codependent really at its core means is that you rescue people from the consequences of their behavior and uh, uh, you lose yourself in that process. Um, you'll avoid people. You'll develop ways to covertly, covertly control people. Um, you'll experiment with drugs or sex to find belonging, which often leads to more pain and deeper need for self-worth and acceptance. So think about the way that Christians approach this, right? We, uh, a couple of years ago, especially when I was growing up and a teenager, um, the, the, the rates of teenage pregnancy were going up right? Uh, and, and we're dealing with kind of a, a sexual crisis today as far as uh, marriage kind of become falling out of popularity with people. Um, isn't it interesting that the way the church has attacked this is, you are evil, you are, you are doing bad things, we need to stop this, we need God in our country again. But what is actually possibly at the root of this? Fear of rejection. And what is the church doing to the people that are, that are battling these things? Rejecting them. Right? <laughs> what else? Uh, when, you, when you have the fear of rejection, you'll be depressed. You'll repeat negative messages over and over in your mind. Uh, you'll be hypersensitive to the opinions of others. <laughs> I was definitely there. Um, and this is huge. This is huge. You will be unable to truly give and receive love. It will be impossible for you to give and to receive love, you, because you'll find it difficult to open up, uh, because revealing those inner thoughts, those inner feelings, those inner motives may lead, you'll, you'll be letting people know who you are, and if they reject who you really are, you can't deal with that pain, and so instead, what you do is you maintain superficial relationships, so, totally surface, and quite possibly, you'll live in isolation. You'll live without relationships because it's just safer that way, and that's how I can keep my place happy. Nothing hurts quite like rejection. And here's the truth that people tend to forget. Not everyone is going to be your friend. Not everyone is going to like you. It's just that simple. If our self-worth is based on the opinions of other people, fear will control us. And it will bring us into bondage. It doesn't mean that you're worth any less. But sometimes we really, really, really want that person to like us and we, want, and we let those things steal what the Holy Spirit has sealed. That freedom that we have in Jesus. Because no longer is Christ our master it's other people. We're trying to serve other people. We're trying to mold ourselves into the image of other people. The vision is no longer, it's actually other people. Does that make sense? Because what you're trying to do is conform yourself to an image of somebody else's mind, of creation's mind, instead of the mind of your God. And that's a problem. That's a big, 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 big problem. So your identity is decided by somebody else. And if that's the case, you don't know who you really are. I didn't know who I really am. And in some ways, we're all still trying to discover that, I think, in a lot of ways. 
But I hadn't defined those boundaries and I hadn't decided that this is who I am and who I am has value. And that's difficult if you have something in your past, isn't it? If you've got some sort of failure, if you've got some sort of mess up in your life. It's really hard to look at yourself and, and, and say I'm valuable. Or maybe even today you're sitting in here and you're like, you don't know what I did last night. You don't know what kind of addictions I'm battling. Like I am, I am not, like I'm surprised the chair I'm sitting in hasn't started on fire yet because, right? Don't we feel like that some days? They're just like all eyes are on you. And I feel like that every week. Uh, but sorry, I just wanted to lift the mood a little bit. Um, but don't you feel that way sometimes? That, you, that you're, just, you're just battling and you feel unworthy. You feel like the songs you're singing are just hitting a ceiling. The prayers that you pray are just not getting to God and you just feel alone. How in the world can I be valuable if what I've done has caused some level of destruction? But I want you to remember this. I try to say this often. You are not what you've done. You are not what you've done. Just like as a parent looks at a child and says, no, that child isn't worth any less to that parent just because that behavior surfaced. God looks down on his people. The value is not decided by our actions. Absolutely, I think God is disappointed when we fall into sin, especially when we willingly walk through that door into sin. But our significance comes from someplace else. Sometimes what we've done is all people see. We need to find a different well to drink from, another source that satisfies, potentially forever. The same, the same guy that we talked about earlier, the Apostle Paul, um, who at one point, just to let you know where he's coming from as we, as we talk about this, um, he was responsible for murdering Christians before he found Jesus. <laughs> so he's got kind of one of the worst offenses on his record and multiple times. Um, so he knows what it's like to face exactly what we're talking about today, that people may look at him and, and say that you're not worth as much because you've got such a dirty past. You, you're not um, who you think you are. He says this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. He says, he says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he, talking God, has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. So what he's saying is that one time we were distant from God. Not because God decided that, but because we felt it. Because we felt ashamed. Because we felt like we were unworthy. Because we felt like everyone around us was saying that somehow we didn't measure up. People at work, people at home, people in the church, they all looked down on me. So how can God have a good opinion of me? Surely he feels the same way. And so you see how that fear of rejection works, right? Here's why God loves you. And there's a key word in this verse. So if you take notes, you might want to underline or circle or highlight whatever you do. Because he has reconciled you. Oh, can you go back one slide, Keith? That verse isn't there? Okay. He has reconciled you. So what does that word mean? Reconciliation is a twofold, a twofold thing. It's a resolution of problems and a restoration of friendship. Can you restore a friendship without resolving problems? Actually, you can. It's just a dysfunctional relationship. You know what I mean? You guys, you, you guys have all seen, remember in high school when you had that dating couple that like broke up and got back together like a thousand times? You know, and you guys are like, you're idiots. You shouldn't be doing this. You know, it's just going to end the same way again. Um, they were trying to reconcile without ever solving the issue. And, and so, yeah, you can have a friendship. You can have periods of friendship, I guess you could say, but it breaks down. Can you have um, a resolution of problems without the restoration of friendship? Yes. Absolutely, you can. You can have those two things, but 
Either of those separately is not reconciliation. What reconciliation is is a resolution of problems and a restoration of friendship. Most of the time, what Christians try to do is we try to resolve our problems, but we forget to restore the relationship with our God. Think about that for a second. We try to resolve our problems. So we behavior, we have an addiction, so we're going to fight like crazy to, 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 to fix that addiction, right? We say words that we shouldn't say because they're offensive to other people or they're crass or they're uh, 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 just, just not pure. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and so we try to like, you know, we try to clean up our language. We try to be better about that. There's nothing wrong with trying to be a better person, trying to be more righteous, trying to follow the commands of Christ. But what we forget in reconciliation and what God has done for us through Jesus Christ is that restoration of friendship. So many Christians view God as this mighty smiter kind of a God that as soon as you mess up, he's going to come at you with a fist and crush you. And I'm telling you today, that's not what God did on the cross. It was not give himself permission to look at you and have contempt toward you. Reconciliation is so, so important. So at one time, there was this space between you and God. You had had a falling out of some kind. And at one time there was distance. It doesn't mean that God didn't value you. Can I get an amen? amen? Thank you. God didn't think you were worth nothing just because you messed up. He just told you no. But the shame that you're carrying has no place in the kingdom of God. That fear of rejection that you're looking at God with, when we're afraid to walk into a church, when we're afraid to approach spiritual things, that is a fear of rejection. And that fear of rejection isn't worthy of heaven. Instead, of God shrugging his God-sized shoulders and going, oh well, they made their bed and they, now they got to lay in it. Our God did something about it. He did something about it. God has reconciled you through Jesus' physical death that he willingly laid down his life, his perfect life, so that it could be transferred to you and to me. And I know if you're hearing that for the first time, it sounds kind of weird. There's a lot more that could be said about that and how that works and the mechanics of it all. And it's an awesome conversation to have. But in a nutshell, that's what's happening. And when you choose to link your life to Jesus' death and resurrection, when you choose to believe it, that it was enough to make you worthy before God, it results in what we call new life. Or salvation. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, one of my favorite texts in the Bible. It says, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is he's seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And this is this is important. For you died. When you link your life to Christ, you die, and your life is hidden with Christ. In God, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Isn't that cool? That your life is now hidden away with Christ. It's no longer in your hands. It's no longer dependent upon your performance. It's no longer dependent upon what you think people think of you. Say that five times fast. So last week we talked about justification. We talked about how God has declared you righteous on behalf of Jesus' death and resurrection, that the judge was banging his gavel, right? And saying, this is what is and will be forever. He said, you are righteous before me because of Christ's death, because of the cross, because of everything that's happened, you are declared righteous. It's as if you've never sinned before me. That's different from reconciliation. 
Because it's in reconciliation after the judge has declared you righteous that he remembers the former, he no longer remembers the former life. That he no longer has contempt or wrath for you. And so the reconciliation that is initiated by God, you didn't have to do anything to initiate it. The reconciliation that is initiated by God, rooted in Christ's death, It results in the removal of any form of wrath, any desire to punish you. There is discipline. There's a difference between when a when a a parent corrects a child and when a parent abuses a child, right? God is not looking to needlessly punish you. He may be looking to discipline you in order to bring a right, a righteousness out of you. But he's never looking to be like, oh man, that was dumb, you know, and just send bad circumstances into your life. Sometimes we fall in that line of thinking, we fall in that temptation. It's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches us. According to, first, to Colossians 1, we are presented before God as holy, faultless, and blameless when we're hidden away with Christ. <laughs> so he looks at us. God looks at us through the lens of Jesus, his own son, and sees us as his children as well. As holy, faultless, and blameless. Children of God. Can you say that about yourself this morning? Can you declare that because of your faith in Jesus, not because of your performance, but because of your faith in Jesus, you are holy, faultless, and blameless before God? Because sometimes... Actually, more than that, oftentimes, that's what our faith is about. We want to make faith about praying harder and changing our circumstances and being a force in this world, but really what we need our faith to be about is just trusting in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he is enough, that we'll never be enough, but that he is enough, and that even though I sinned last night, (laughs) I am holy faultless and blameless because of the blood of Jesus Christ that covers over me. That's a deep breath, isn't it? That's like coming out from underneath the water that you've been, trying, you've been drowning in for your entire lifetime. That's like coming out again, that first breath of fresh air. It's amazing. It's in reconciliation that the judge comes down from behind his bench and approaches us saying, I know. He says, I know everything. I know all of the things that you're hanging on to. I know all of the skeletons that are hiding in your closet. I know all of the lies that you've told. I know everything about you. But the price has been paid and I love you. And I love you. I read this in my study this week, and I thought that you really needed to hear this. Our true destiny and dignity are found only through union with the crucified Christ. Our true destiny and dignity are found only through union with the crucified Christ. Your dignity isn't found in you. How could it be? I'm a sinner just like you're a sinner. I constantly try to be transparent about some of the struggles that I have because sometimes there's this tendency to put the pastor on a pedestal, right? Right? And so when he sins, right? 
I'm susceptible to it too, all right? It doesn't mean we don't deal with it. But I have no dignity if it's only in myself. I believe I have no destiny on my own. It's through the cross. It can only be found with the crucified Christ. It's in Christ and what his love through the cross declares. Your significance comes from Christ, that he found you significant enough to trade his very life. Robert McGee says in, this, in, in his book that I've been using as a reference for this teaching, um, he says this, he says, if any sin is so filthy and vile that it makes us less acceptable to him, then the cross is insufficient. If the cross isn't sufficient for all sin, then the Bible is in error uh, when it says that he forgave all your sins. God took our sins and canceled them by nailing them to Christ's cross. In this way, God also took away Satan's power to condemn us for sin. So you see, nothing you will ever do can nullify your reconciliation and make you unacceptable to God. Is that not awesome? That is something that we should be rejoicing about. This is why we worship. This is why the cross is so significant. This is why we praise Jesus today. Because he loved us before we were even born. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died. We are absolutely secure in Christ. The point of the cross is that through Christ's death and resurrection, we have become acceptable to God, and it was God's decision to make this way possible. Your worth was declared by God. Facing your fear of rejection is absolutely difficult. Don't you agree, people pleasers? Saying no to somebody that you really don't want to say no to, but you know you should say no to, is a freaking scary thing, isn't it? Because what if they don't like me anymore? My big thing is, what if people leave the church? Because I said no. You know, I've been practicing that. The other day, Chuck came in my office and I said, I don't got any time today, buddy. So let's, let's not have a conversation, right? And I could tell he was kind of like, whoa, wait a second. You know, that's not how it normally works. And I felt bad. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I felt bad. Because I was like, I got a lot of work to do. I got to get it done. And I wanted to go see Infinity Wars. So, um, uh, no. Um, it's hard to change. Change always brings pain, does it not? You know when you're forced to change? Is when staying the way that you are hurts more than the pain that change takes. So you don't see people change until they have a heart attack, right? You don't see people start to, to change the way they operate at work until they get a demotion or uh, uh, they get fired or they, they whatever, right? You don't see people change until there's a boundary set in the relationship that says, if you don't change, this is going to happen. Because when the pain gets too much, change is difficult. And I want to encourage you to begin to try and shift that fear away from your life. To live in this reality is so important because if we choose to continue to base our self-worth on the approval of others, then we are declaring our li uh, with our lives, listen to me, I'm almost finished. We are declaring with our lives when we base our approval or our self-worth on the approval of others, we are saying that our ability to please other people is worth more than Christ's payment on the cross. That is what your life is living when you choose to live that way. And I don't know about you. I don't want to live that way. Because another man died for me before I was even born, before I even understood him, before anything. God reached out his hand and he loved me so much that he could do what, what nobody else could do for me and that I could do nothing with myself. I don't want to live that way and disrespect that, to cheapen that so much as to say, yeah, I can't be real. 
So the way we exercise that faith is not by trying to become more important to the kingdom, though uh, through what we do, but faith is exercised by drawing closer to Christ, by trusting that Christ is enough. Have you guys been enjoying the giving talks the last few weeks that we've been doing them? With the different people, different voices that have been coming up and talking? It's been awesome. We let Chuck out of the box last week, and that was, that was fantastic. He did a great job. I, you know, don't you agree? Devil made him do it. Um, every single person, I'm pretty, pretty close to every single person, their knees have been knocking before they get up here. They're so nervous, right? But you appreciate it, don't you? Absolutely. That's a fear of rejection. You know one of my biggest insecurities when I first started leading this church? I mean, I was, what, 25 when I, when I started this job. One of the biggest things I had to battle was knowing that in about 15 minutes from now, y'all are going to be driving home or going to a restaurant. You're going to be talking about everything that I just said and evaluating. You know what I mean? And I had to get okay with that because I know that some of you are going to be like, yeah, that didn't make much sense to me today. And he talked too long. He's got to get, stop it, Right? <laughs> Yeah, I understand. I'm getting you used to it. <clears throat> it's in preparation for when we start doing all-day church services. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, I think this is important. That's why I've been taking some more time on these ones. But um, when you don't fear rejection, you, you are able to come into your own and, and, and be who God's created you to be. I bring up the giving talks because every single person that we've asked to come up here that, and has done it has, has done a fantastic job. And they've blessed you because of it. And there's going to be a day when you're going to get a phone call and we're going to say, hey, can you do this for the church? And you're going to be like, no. And we're going to be like, haven't you been blessed by everybody else that has faced that fear to get up on the stage and do this? Yeah. So you're going to do it? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you need to think about it. You know, think about how, if you could get rid of that fear of rejection... How could you be a blessing to the church? How could you be a blessing to the community? How could you be a, a sense of hope in somebody else's life if you could move past that fear? The way we exercise our faith, I know I've said this, but I want to say this again, is not trying to become more important to the kingdom through what we do. Faith is exercised by drawing closer to Christ, by trusting that Christ is enough. Because if you don't believe that, it's going to lead to so many other problems. And we've just explored one facet of this today. And you, we, we heard all of the things, that possibly the fear of rejection could lead. But how freeing is that? How freeing is that? How freeing is it to know that if you really tick someone off, if you're rejected by someone in your life, if you've lived with a chatterbox in your brain all your life that's just been constantly telling you, you're not good enough, you're not worth it. You, those people think you're nuts and you're, you're stupid and you're, you know, you're not worth anything. You just better sit down and shush, right? Some of you guys got that thing going off in your brain. I have. In the power of Jesus Christ, you can look at it and say, shut up. Amen. You know what I mean? I know that's not necessarily church appropriate all the time, but you can. Especially because it's you. So <laughs> if it's okay for you. Um, but how freeing is it to look at the cross and know that no one, no one you've ever seen in all of creation has the power to steal what has been done on the cross for you. No one can. And God's not going to remove it. He's promised that to us. Nothing has the ability to steal the love of God Almighty from you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the only approval that matters. Only approval that matters. So I'm going to close today by giving you a powerful way of combating this lie that you need the approval of people. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter of the Bible. Uh, it's read at many a weddings. Um, you've probably heard it before, even if you're not recognizing chapter and verse, but it's a picture of what true love looks like. Um, and, and we know by reading elsewhere in the Bible that God is love, right? That God is love. And so really what we're looking at is a description of our God. And so try this. Um, replace love when you're reading that chapter 
with my Father or my God, whichever you prefer. So I'm going to put these on the screen. I'm going to read through them once, and I'm going to ask Keith to go back, and then I want you to read them with me, okay? So I just want to give you an introduction to it, and then we're going to read it together as a responsive reading, and then we're going to close. My God is patient. My God is kind. My God does not envy. My God is not boastful. My God is not arrogant. My God is not rude. My God is not self-seeking. Amen, right? My God is not irritable. Amen, right? Yeah, there you go. My God does not keep a record of wrongs. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing right there. My God finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. My God, this is super, super important. My God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And most importantly, my God never ends. Can you back that up? Let's read that together, all right? Here we go. My God is patient. My God is kind. My God does not envy. My God is not boastful. My God is not arrogant. My God is not rude. My God is not self-seeking. My God is not irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. My God finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. My God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. My God never ends. Like, you should write that out. You should, like, make a bookmark out of it. You, you, you need to post it on your bathroom mirror. Write it with a dry erase marker on the mirror, whatever you need to do, so that you read it every single morning. Put it on your dashboard. Memorize it, even. Because it's the true image of our Father who now accepts us as holy, faultless, blameless. This is what He really thinks of you. Stop putting on God what you think He thinks of you. Right? He's not the mighty spider. My God never ends. He endures all things. He bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. You know what all things are? That's you. He endures you when you're acting up. Right? (laughs) But He believes in you and He hopes in you too. Oh man, let that stir up your love for God today. Let that take everything away. Let that change the way that you see everything about your God. That will change the way you worship. That will change the way you pray. That will change the way you interact with God. That will steal away your fear of approaching Him with all of the right words and all of the right attitudes and all of the right patterns. Ditch the well of people that's only filled with salt water that never satisfies, but ends up making us thirstier (laughs) and run to the well of endless supply Bound with boundless worth and unconditional love. Your significance was determined by God long ago. It's deeply rooted in the cross. And so the question for you today is, are you willing to believe it? And are you willing to trust in it? Are you willing to have faith in Jesus? Faith in Jesus means that you believe that because of his blood, because of his sacrifice, because of, your, of his resurrection, that you share in that too. That you are presented to the Father as holy, faultless, and blameless. We're going to sing Magnify again. I just want to invite you to sing it loud. Take all my shame away. Take all my sin away. Take all my guilt away. Take all my pride, all my arrogance, all of these things away. Let it just be about you.